the Irrational Confidence Podcast. We're talking college football, and it is the mysterious week zero. We still don't understand why we have a week zero. Actually, it is if you're playing Hawaii or going across to Europe. Maybe you get to play a week early, but it's college football. It's back, baby. Better, no better time than the present. I'm joined by my co-host, the man who will always be with me throughout this college football season. Fresh, fresh. How you doing, buddy? That's week zero. We're actually doing game previews. You know, we've had laundry list of team previews, rankings, writing articles on the website for spinupsports.com. It's just we're finally back into the flow now of games, week and execution, schemes, players. It's exciting. I know it's week zero, and we only have, what, four total games across the, the spectrum, but just talking about football and preview and games is special, and we should never lose sight of that fact right there. Hey, yeah, folks, and as we're rolling through this season, do us one big favor. It's the easy way to help us out. Hit that subscribe button. Leave the video a like. Leave us a comment, whatever you think, on our game preview. It doesn't cost you anything. keeps our shows free and everything like that. So we appreciate everyone who's subscribed to the channel so far. And let's lock and load here fresh. First game that we're going after. This game is going to be played in Nevada, in Reno. The SMU Mustangs going to the Nevada Wolfpack. SMU is a member of the ACC now, but they're taking $0 from the ACC. At time of record, SMU is a 27.5 point Road favorite. Ooh, boy, howdy, fresh. Nevada, how how far are the mighty have fallen? Well, ever since their coach departed, went to Colorado State a couple of years ago, took a bunch of players with them. Um, that program's just, I think it's bottomed out. That's probably the best way to put it. Last year, averaged 17 points a game and allowed at least 27 points or more in 10 of their 12 games. Like, that team was just horrendous. And that is in the Mountain West, is a pretty good conference. Let's not overlook that fact, but they were just – they, they they did not offer any um, effort or defense against an opponent when they came into that in any of those games last year. And I don't really see that happening going forward this season. Uh, it's a there's some been some talent there in the past, but right now it just seems like that cupboard is very bare um, in Reno, and they are um, they're on the cusp of getting blown out in Week Zero here by SMU. You, know, you mentioned SMU coming to the ACC, and it, we'll talk about it a little bit later about the head scratcher on why they made that move to, the, to that conference and not trying to go to the Big Twelve or anything, but this team is very, very talented. They were very talented last year in the AAC. Um, Preston Stone, at quarterback, you're going to hear a lot of his name this season, and he's going to have a chance to put up some serious numbers. But the depth is not just him. It's not just the quarterback. They had eight receivers last year with at least 300 yards receiving in 2023. Because they spread the football around. There's no one guy you have to focus on. And it gives quarterbacks options like Preston Stone who can make things happen in any alignment they're in. The guys will produce points, produce yards, first downs and really keep the offense moving. And they're not just also a, a, first, a pass first team. They are very balanced. They threw for 3,800 yards and change, and they ran for 2,400. They are going to put points up. They're going to move the football. There's not very many defenses in the league that are truly going to be able to shut them down. Yes, the level of play in the, AA, in the ACC will be a step up from where they were last year, but their schedule, when you look at it, is not overwhelming. Right. It's not going to be overwhelming. not going to be daunting, right. especially from a defensive perspective, and that will give them a chance to really – keep training that offense and developing. And once the dollars kick in from everything that they've raised, which has been a buku amount, they're going to start getting NIL deals. They're going to start getting kids from Texas. And they're going to start layering up because now they are no longer in the AAC. They're in the ACC. That right there, brand alone, is going to give them something to build off of. Yeah. Fresh, people don't understand. Again, they look at the SMU and go, why in the world would you take $0 to join the AAC? ACC, as I'm, I'm making the same mistake here, trying to get used to saying ACC for them. But they have one of the most uh, deep pocket boosters in the entire country, an alumni base there. They have a lot of serious money behind it. And a lot of those old boosters remember the glory days of the 70s and 80s and coming up and the party being there in Dallas with SMU. I'm telling you, man there's a fan base and an alumni base that is motivated to see this team get back. They've been great. They've been really like an under the radar, really good team. You got to remember a couple of years ago with Tanner Mordecai and him just putting up mass amounts of stats. I want to say it was, was it maybe rivalry week or the week before that we did the big 
you know, talk about SMU making a huge jump. And I think Tulane jumped them very late in the season um, to win that conference, if I remember right. This is a great team because you remember two years ago, we were talking about like Tanner Mordecai left SMU and we're like, why in the world? He's going to Wisconsin. Wisconsin's going through a coaching change. And SMU didn't do anything to try to hold on to him. They have the money. This is not a poor program. But what they saw is they had Preston Stone in the pipeline coming on up there. They got Jalen McKnightington uh, coming back with him. Great rushing attack. And then they got a guy, a senior wide receiver like Jake Bailey, who's able to lead that team. He was their leading receiver. But like you said, they spread the ball around so much last year that it, it makes it difficult for a defense, especially like a team like Nevada, where they are they are really going through it after this coaching change. Um, you know, I look at Nevada and say, you know, there's some talent there. there it's not like a, a terrible program. They got Brandon Lewis. And again, dual threat quarterback, but I think you have to be a dual threat quarterback because that offensive line is just abysmal. And that really has been the, the downfall for Nevada is that they've completely lost any talent. You know, Nevada was able to always produce some sort of quality offensive lineman. You know, you find a guy in the third or fourth round of the NFL draft that went there and they're like, oh, wow, he turned out to be a half decent offensive lineman. They were always able to produce that. They, those days are long gone right now. I don't know. I don't see the Wolfpack being competitive in this game. I think this is one of those things, Fresh, where you just want to make sure that you're not beat by, like, 50 in this game. This will be beat down city. Um, I've been able to cover the spread. Uh, this Nevada, it will not be a Nevada Wolfpack party, that's for sure. Um, oh. But it will be, if you're watching at 8 o'clock at night, you know, you've made it through the, the couple games ahead of time. It's on, you know, CBS Sports Network. You can get that channel. Tune in, watch, get a little peek at Preston Stone on that offense, and you'll be intrigued. Um, the talent. We'll obviously see what that matriculates to later down the season against more tougher competition. But right now, it's a it's a chance for them to get their feet under them. There's no preseason in college football, which I think we always forget. That first couple of weeks, people are still trying to figure it out. They've only scrimmaged against each other. How does everything sort of sink and flow in, in, in the real game plan? Yeah, and we were talking about this. SMU, after, what, the first week in October, their schedule, they should have enough talent to beat anyone else on their schedule once they get past Louisville, and they should be competitive versus a team like Louisville. Yeah, I mean, Louisville, I'm not, Probably too, I'm not a big fan of Tyler Show. I mean, he's been – he was a dud at Oregon. He was a dud at Texas Tech. Um, maybe Brom can revive him at Louisville, but they have talent. They're coming up that last year. That will probably be a good, a good you know, barometer, a good matchup for them to see right, where do we truly stay in the ACC. Um, you know, going forward, what are our, our prospects for being a truly successful team to challenge for a playoff spot or even an ACC title? I know that's pretty bold speaking, but that should be your goal. You're coming to the league. At some point, you got to know, all right, how long is it going to take my program to be able to contend for a championship? Um, right. If there's no hope, then why did you move that league? That brings you nothing, uh, and like that's the that's the question you ask. Can we actually contend for a title in this league? Because winning is what matters, folks. If you're going to somewhere, I'm just going to be tagging along. Like, what are you doing? You're tagging along just to to be not forgotten. Mm-hmm. You got a chance to dictate where you want to go. You got to make sure you take advantage of the opportunity. Yeah. All right, Fresh, let's go to the game of the week. The reason all of us are going to be tuning in on week zero. It's in Dublin, Ireland. Fresh, you're a fan of the Irish and, and all their great things that they produce out there. I enjoy a nice Guinness every once in a while here. But we got the Florida State Seminoles traveling out to Dublin to play the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. Right now, time record spread is Florida State is an 11 and a half neutral site favorite in this over under is set at 56 and a half here fresh it, it's like the question of two teams here georgia tech is bringing back i believe i said seven 16 or 17 starters this from last year on a team that went a a very respectable seven and six uh winning big in the bowl game against ucf florida state had uh, that miraculous run ended by the untimely injury to Jordan Travis and then the the kind of opt out bowl game where no one really played against Georgia or anything like that and then Florida State hits the transfer portal big because they get DJU who's been at Clemson Oregon State and now finishing his career with 
Mike Norvell at Florida State. Man, this is going to be a fun one. I think that a lot of people are just going to automatically go like Florida State in the 11 and a half on neutral site. But Dublin is tricky for a lot of teams, man. It's not an easy place to play in. And it's going to be interesting to see the Seminoles get up there. What do you got? Well, being this the first game, it's a spectacle event. Everyone's going to be watching. Everyone's going to be dissecting. It's not like it's on week one where there's 10 other games kicking off at the same time and you might be distracted. Everyone's going to be watching this football game. Right. The last memory they have, I don't care opt-outs or not, you got drubbed by the dogs down in Miami. You offense without Jordan Travis did not look very good versus Louisville in the ACC title game. You struggled versus Florida in that game there, even though you didn't have Travis. Like we, had, the Florida State team hasn't been dominant in a while. Um, and they're kind of like, all right, we've heard all this, all this talk in the off season. You wanted to leave. You're mad you didn't get in the playoff. ESPN is, you know, biased against you. The talking time is over. Um, no one feels sorry for Florida State anymore. If they did, you're done. It's time to start. It's a new season. You got to go and take advantage of the opportunity. You have 17 new transfers. How do those players blend in with this program? You've only had spring practice and fall practice, scrimmages against each other. Where's this team actually going to truly be tested again? You have to come out with your hair on fire in Dublin immediately because Georgia Tech, I'll get into a little bit later, that's a rising program, and Brent Key being an alum and having those returning starters has that team. They're going to be ready to play because they have nothing yep. to lose. No one expects them to compete. They've been up and coming. They've been struggling for a few years. They made the bowl. They're going to be ready to play. You've got to be ready to go. DJU, right. your third team in three years. Clemson, you really struggled. Oregon State, you were blessed with an amazing offensive line, a very good defense, a very quarterback-friendly offense. Now you're trying to learn a whole new set of guys here at Florida State. Their top three receivers last year are all gone in the draft. You lost your top running back. Offensive line, I think, is okay for Florida State. They have some solid returning starters there. But how does this bland work? At DKU, right. I'm going to be serious. Not an amazing quarterback, folks. He's not lighting up the world. He's very he's consistent, but he's not the guy who's putting up 4,000, 5,000 yards, making amazing plays with the legs, throwing tons of touchdowns. He's been a manager understanding the offense. He's not going to save the day like Jordan Travis's legs saved the day for Florida State a lot. He made plays on his own. DJU's not making those plays. That means this offense has got to be ready to roll, and they've all got to be in sync. Right. Defensive, you know, defensively, you lost Burst, Fisk, Bethune, Deloach, Dent, Green, Jones, Lovage Sr., all to the NFL draft. That's a whole heck of a lot of that first year of that depth chart gone. How does that defense get up to speed? immediately and ready to play. Defense usually plays faster than offense no matter what, but these guys got to be ready to rock and roll. They've got to set the tone. They might set the tone the entire year while that offense grows. Patrick Payton off the edge, George transfer Marvin Jones Jr. off the edge. The two defensive ends are going to wreak havoc for that Florida State defense. They're going to bring the pressure on the quarterbacks, and that actually might be the best thing they have for them, just constantly harassing the opponent. But who's going to be at the deepest tackle spot going to step up? Who at linebackers ready to play? Secondary, you got Shaheen Brown and Fentrell Cypress, the second. Who else is going to join them at a secondary and really develop? This is the question this team's got to figure out. You, the, the one problem of bringing in transfers and not having tons of your roster being through the, the initial signing day period of high school recruits is you might get a guy for a year. You might get a guy for two years. But how quickly do they acclimate to the program and blend into the culture? If you have a guy here as a freshman, be red shirts his first year, you have him in the building, he's understanding, gets the scheme, he's been practicing, communicating, like that right there helps them be a little more forward. We look back two years ago, that Florida State team in 2022 had a lot of transfers. It took them a while to find their feet. They were exciting. They beat an, an LSU team that was sort of in the same mode. They both grew as the season went on. And last year, they burst on the scene. This year, all these transfers, are we going to see a slow upstart from Florida State? And then maybe if they're two-year guys, next year they jump? Who knows? I just how fast is the team going to be able to ready to play? Is what my biggest question is because there's a lot hanging off the offseason, a lot from last year, a lot of eyes, a lot of pressure. They've got to be elite from the very, very beginning in this football game, or they get upset. I'm not going to say they're going to get blown out, but they could get upset, and that right there will add more credence to, well, you guys, we all knew you weren't worthy, and they're going to hear that talk, and it's going to go on and on and on. It's a must-win game for Florida State. There's no, well, we played great. It's you know we're all one ACC. We'll go from there. They've got to win, and in my case, they've got to win big to keep all the doubters pushed away. Looking at Tech, physical team, offensive line, defensive line, they've built this very, very strongly in the trenches. Jamal Haynes at running back and Haynes King are the two keys. Haynes King, the quarterback, Jamal Haynes, the running back, the two of them were very, very successful and grew up last year. 
they're going to be called upon, not just in this game, but going forward in Buster Faulkner's offense to really take it to a next level. Quietly, they put, put together a passing game that kind of gave them some balance. Eric Shingleton, Malik Rutherford, the two top receivers, both back this year. Young guys, how do they take that jump in, in this next season, in this next part of this offense under Faulkner? Um, it's, it's a, if you remember Todd Munkin's offense at Georgia a couple of years ago, that he was, uh, Faulkner was a pupil of his. They're going to run the ball on the line of scrimmage, play action, a lot of running backs and tight ends involved heavily. That's the kind of offense you're going to see in this football game. They're going to try to slow it down. They're going to try to be very meticulous with the football, drive it, time of possession, keep that Florida State offense on the sideline and wear them out. That's the approach that's going to happen in this football game. It's not going to be a flashy five receiver spreads. They're going to run the football, play action. They're going to have to dictate that pace towards Florida State on the last scrimmage. If Florida State can find ways to dominate line of scrimmage, the game is over. But if they're getting run on, eventually, how's that conditioning from summer practice? Are the guys ready to play? Are their legs truly under them? You know, how does that philosophy sort of play in when the ball game works itself through? Georgia Tech, they've built a good team. Um, I think this football game in the end, Florida State is going to win a very, very close game. If you give me Georgia Tech and the points. Florida State wins by eight, nine, maybe, if they're lucky. But it's going to be a slugfest. It's going to be a battle. And Florida State will get lucky, I think, because their defense can have a little more talent in the end. But it's not going to be a blowout city. It's not going to be this Florida State, hey, we told you we were great. They're going to have to learn and grow as the season goes on. And if the ball bounces one or another, Georgia Tech can pull off the upset on, on Saturday. Brett, Sherry, you're spot on with it. Florida State, if they're going to win this game and win this game going away, it's not going to be the passing attack. It's going to be the rushing attack by them. They're going to need to completely smack Georgia Tech's defensive line in the mouth and just overpower them from start to finish. What we need to see from Florida State is that, okay, it's first down. We're going to run the ball. We're going to go into a run-heavy formation here, and we're going to smack you in the mouth and get five, six yards on first down. Setting up second and five, second and four, anything that's a short yardage where you can go, I got two, at least two, maybe three plays, depending on where I am in, on the field, that to pick up this first down. And again, where I can methodically move the ball down the field, you know, I keep Georgia Tech's defense on the field, get that, keep that offense off, and being able to just to smack them in the mouth. You know, everyone's going to talk about the transfer of DJU. And really, the one that we should really be talking about is Roy Dell Williams, the running back transfer from Alabama. The dude was a solid running back at Bama. I mean, I don't want to say he was like, he wasn't to the likes of like Ingraham and um, Trent Richardson or any of the other great Derrick Henry, or any of the great Alabama running backs that came through, but the dude was solid and strong. You take a look, he was averaging, you know, take a look at some of his averages a game. Look at five yards of carry at times. And this guy can really be a monster when necessary. I think they struggled a little bit with his health. So we'll see how he handles that this year. Maybe, you know, you're going up against competition. The ACC might be a little bit different. If he's able to get really rolling and really cruising along, that this game could get over quick, fast, and in a hurry. I don't think that's going to happen because I think Georgia Tech has done everything in their power to build a very successful football team. I am I'm very <clears throat> fresh. This is tough for me because I really want to take Georgia Tech in the upset. I really want to take them straight up. I think they're going to pull the upset here, but there's just something in my mind that the ball is going to bounce a weird way that Tech might be up at the end of the game and just Florida State steals a victory from the jaws of defeat in this type of game here. I love Haynes King, man. I think this kid has got something special to him. I think he's going to really light up the ACC on fire. Everyone else is talking about all these other quarterbacks and what Georgia Tech, like you said, have has built over the last couple of years. This kid is something that, you know, I, I'm not calling him to win the Heisman or anything along those lines, but, you know, Never say never on, on certain things. But the nice thing is that he came in as a little bit more of a mobile quarterback. And as you've talked about how they've developed the passing attack there in Atlanta, he really did a, a better job. If you take a look at how he performed last year compared to DJU, the kid was a better passer than DJU. 
you know, better completion percentage. You take a look, he had 27 touchdowns. If he can cut down on those interceptions, you know, he throws 16 picks, he threw an interception a game, cuts that down. This Georgia Tech team could be like that sleeper team in the ACC. They they are a team that you cannot just sleep on and think that you're going to win on this one. I'm going to stick with my initial one because I'm trying to like talk myself into taking Georgia Tech in the upset, and I just can't do it. Uh, I'm going to go give me the 11 and a half in Georgia Tech, but I think Florida State wins it in the end. It's, you know, Haynes King has gotten comfortable in that offense. I think that helps. DJ, right. you being a new offense, they're going to have to run the ball a lot and get his confidence up. And you right. brought up Rydell Williams. Also, Indiana transfer Jalen Lucas, leading rusher for the Hoosiers, now down in Tallahassee. Right. And then also Lawrence to- Tofield. So they have a, a, a triumvirate of, of running backs there. And I got a feeling right. ultimately we're going to get a heavy dose of football early on while DJU and that passing attack grows. It, it might not be pretty, but you know what? In the end, the Florida State fans, if you win week one, you're still 1 0 in the ACC. Right. You get a chance to take a deep breath and get Boston College back in dope the week after. You chance, all right, got a feet under us. We're good to go. If you right. go out to Ireland and you lose, like I said earlier, the chatter, the noise is going to be turned up significantly. There's going to be a lot of questions and a lot of soul searching um, that might happen. So get it done. Just get the win and move on. And don't care about how pretty it is. W is a W in the end of the day. Yeah, remember, because Dublin, Ireland is a tough place to play. A couple of years ago, Nebraska. Better not Scott, lose any beer. Make sure they yep. have enough beer for everybody. Yep. Nebraska went on a Scott Frost death march after lo- the one loss, the one w- or the one win of the year Northwestern gets is in Dublin, Ireland against Nebraska in the ugly game and basically s- sealed Scott Frost's fate going forward. Just kind of became a ticking time bomb there. But fresh, we got co- college football back on Saturday. It's going to be a- an amazing time. I know it's just like a tease there. It's, it's an exciting, exciting time, though, man. I, I can't wait to get back into it. And then we'll be back, like, less than a few days later to a loaded week one. A loaded, loaded week, week one, one. Fresh. Thursday night games, Friday night games, Saturday games, Sunday games, Monday night games. It's Bring it on. Let's go. Yeah, absolutely. All right, folks, special thanks to our producer, Drew. Without him, none of this is possible. Make sure you check out SpinnableSports.com because the Irrational Confidence Podcast is part of SpinnableSports.com. Like, subscribe, wherever you get your podcast from. Make sure you guys leave us that five-star review because you guys know, Fresh and I, we are those two five-star prospects. Hey, check us out. Follow us on the socials there on Twitter, Instagram, X, whatever it's called these days. I don't know. I don't know much of the social media. So engage with us. We like talking to you guys. We enjoy interacting with you. Leave us the comments. Let us know how right we are or how, you know, we don't know what the heck we're talking about. So subscribe. That's all I got here fresh. I didn't even use my dad jokes to open up the thing. I'll have to save that for the next episode. Save them for week one. Everybody, hit SpinnableSports.com for all of your materials. we got free views for fantasy football, NFL, college football, position groups, conference previews, everything you need. Hit us up on socials, stay engaged, and subscribe on Spinnable Sports, the YouTube channel, and we'll go from there. And with that, bye, y'all.